you look back to the summer holidays of your childhood, do you remember endless sunny days on pristine beaches? We're all prone to nostalgia, of course, but this much is true. Our coastline has changed out of sight. The shore is now dotted with development. So has paradise been lost? Sarah Hall has been checking it out. It's considered one of the most beautiful, unspoilt beaches in the world. Fine white sand, framed by Pahutakawas, if ever there was a beach that epitomised New Zealand's east coast, it would be New Chums on the Coromandel Peninsula. So when the owners announced plans to develop here a few months ago, you could almost hear the collective outrage. For some, developing new chums seemed the final straw. I think the public feel passionate about the coast and it's almost like this was one step too far that this particular beach, which is, you know, very special. Um, but I think it really highlights the concern not only about new chums, but what's happening to the rest of the coast. Raywin Peart grew up spending her summers around the Coromandel in Northland, boating to remote bays. Now an environmental lawyer, when she returned to New Zealand after several years overseas, she was shocked to see the development. When you live in the country year by year, it's quite an incremental change and sometimes you don't quite realise what's happening. But when you've been away um, uh, a few years and you come back, the change is marked. And, and that really galvanised me. Uh, I thought, uh, you know... This, you know, this shouldn't be happening. Why is it happening? Why are we losing these places? And that's what really inspired me to write the book. That book is Castles in the Sand, which outlines the creeping development happening all over the country. Nowhere is it more evident than north of Auckland. Take to the skies and you'll see subdivision after subdivision after subdivision. What was once untouched and undeveloped coastline is now dotted with real estate. We have very weak policy. There is no, no parts of the coast are off limits. Potentially, any part of the coast in private ownership um, can be developed. Uh, and that's where the weakness lies. When the next property um, boom comes around, and it will inevitably, it will be much bigger than the last, the impacts will be much greater, and we will essentially lose it. When you compare the old with the new, you can see why some communities are now trying to stop further development. One place that's changed beyond recognition is Northland's Tutakaka Coast. For 45 years, the community has locked horns with the succession of developers who want to build on one of the last untouched places on the coast, the Nungru Spit. Those opposed say it's flood prone ecologically fragile and should never be built on. When you look at what's happened to other sand spits and you see the development that's occurred and you see the loss to the natural environment, this becomes a precious sand spit, just for that reason. The latest application before council is for 300 homes. Mary Britton from the Sand Spit Protection Society says that would be a tragedy. We would also end up, I think, asking ourselves questions about um, what had happened because we would have lost something that is actually part of what we highly value and we would end up living in a country that we didn't quite recognise. Further north on the isolated Karikari Peninsula there's little sign of life apart from these curious visitors. But the beach could be a lot busier in future if an American landowner gets his way. He wants to build 12 houses on this ridge line. Local Māori claim the development is on a ridge where many of their ancestors are buried in caves. Not just anybody are buried in caves. It's only a high-ranking people are buried in the caves. Commoners like you and I are buried down here on the sand dunes. 
Kaumatua Alan Hitaraka says Māori would be happy for the subdivision to be further back on the land, just not on the undeveloped beachfront. It's not built for, for people to live in it permanently. It's part of a holiday resort and they want to excavate my ancestors out of their burial ground to put a house over there for somebody who don't even live in this country. Here on the Tiarai Peninsula, Māori are on the other side of the argument. The local iwi owns 25% of this beach with a development company. Initially they wanted to build up to 1400 houses here, as well as shops and a hotel. While that's been whittled back to a couple of hundred homes, opposition remains fierce. It's the fact that this is the last beach. There are 17 endangered species on that beach. There's um, the New Zealand's most endangered bird is on that beach. You know, go somewhere else. Mark Walker is the president of the Tiarai Preservation Society. We have overseas visitors that come here and they are just amazed. And then we tell them that, well, yes, we're fighting a development there and they are just abhorred. I mean, they have been through it. They've lost what they've got. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. You cannot get it back. The developers claim they're taking care not to disturb the endangered New Zealand ferry turn, nor do they intend to build right on the beachfront. That fight is now in the High Court, which could end up costing both sides hundreds of thousands of dollars. Money which could be saved if there were clearer rules, according to lawyer Raywin Peart. At the moment, developers can spend a lot of money buying up coastal property, uh, investing and designing developments, only to find that, uh, uh, that there's enormous public opposition. Take New Chums Beach. Despite what many have hailed as a sensitive development, there have been more than a thousand submissions against it. One of the owners, John Darby. We have sort of save the beach uh, campaign mentality where Everyone uh, doesn't get to read the application or understand what was on offer and a populist sort of uh, objection process develops where a lot of people uh, naturally want to save the beach, naturally therefore would oppose any idea of building, not knowing that in fact no buildings were proposed on the beach. The three families who own New Chums want to build 11 batches for themselves 200 metres back from the beach. Another nine sites are closer to neighbouring Whangapoa. All the buildings are so far away from the beach and not visible, you could hardly describe it as even being a beach development. Uh, the buildings are well back. The ownership of the beach is in private ownership. Uh, we think it should be in public ownership. And part of that proposal was we were going to vest it or gift it. I think the developers in New Chums have, have really bent over backwards to, to do their best to design a sensitive development for that area. Um, that is the kind of development we want to encourage in New Zealand, but I just think it's in the wrong place. So who's in charge with regulating all this? Who's to blame for some of our more controversial developments? The Resource Management Act states outstanding natural features and landscapes should be protected from inappropriate subdivision. But who decides what's appropriate and what isn't? That comes down to local councils. Inconsistent. Uh, each area or district has a particular set of rules. Uh, you cross the boundary from one district to the next and the rules can be radically different. Uh, a good example is the difference between Kaipara and Rodney, for example, or Northland to other parts of New Zealand. More subdivision means more rates, more money for council coffers. It's hard for cash-strapped councils to resist. Lawyer Raywin Pett believes the solution is an independent coastal commission, as there is in California, to make the tough decisions. We need an independent 
body that's apart from um, sort of short-term political considerations as arms links from developers. Um, it consists of New Zealanders of high repute and that they um, are given oversight of the New Zealand coast in the long-term national interest. The government has told 60 Minutes an independent commission is unlikely. Instead, we've just had an independent review of our coastal policy, but the government has sat on that for 16 months. Former Conservation Minister Philip Wollaston was part of the inquiry. He was so frustrated by the delay, he leaked the report on the internet. My fear is that um, there is a reluctance to adopt it, at least in the form that uh, it is in, uh, and with those protections, uh, because it would have been easy to do that by now. The review recommended much tighter restrictions on development and called on the government to purchase special areas for perpetuity. We certainly can't afford to buy the whole coastline and no one's suggesting that that, that should happen. Um, can we afford to buy the most significant uh, and outstanding features that, that are important for tourism, are important for our sense of who we are um, and, and you know, are part of our heritage for our kids? Um, I think the other question is, can we afford not to? Do you accept there has been some extremely bad development of our coastline? I accept that there's been some inappropriate development, yes, certainly, of our coastline. Conservation Minister Kate Wilkinson. I actually do trust landowners to, to do the best thing and, and to understand the, the, the importance of stewardship uh, of their land. But there have been many, many landowners have shown the exact opposite of that. And there have been many, many that have been very, very, very good as well. The Coastal Review will finally go before Cabinet next month. The government says it won't adopt all of the recommendations, but there will be some tougher restrictions and clearer policy. But as for taking the decisions out of the hands of local councils, not much chance. Do you really think that councils are the best people to be making these decisions about our coast? I think local communities should be able to make decisions that, that, that relate to them locally. Um, you know, from our point of view, we, we have to put, put in the overall umbrella coastal policy statement. Under that, uh, they can plan for their specific communities. So will the government look to buy some of the more important beaches? The one beach that has stirred up the most passion is New Chums on the Coromandel Peninsula. Is the government looking at it? Well, that's going through its, its legislative process, of which we're, we're, it's, you know, it's a democratic process. It's not on our agenda uh, to do anything further on that. The lack of intervention will be a disappointment to critics who say our untouched beaches, our pristine coasts, are in danger of becoming distant memories faded snapshots of our past. You know, we're being very short-sighted if we say that we're going to sell all the golden geese all once because there'll be no golden eggs after that. I like to uh, think of these areas, I like to call them heritage coasts, you know, that we have a, almost like the jewels in our crown, a network or a necklace, if you like, of these very special parts of the coast that are protected and are part of our heritage coasts, um, which is our legacy for future generations.